Christine Schneider, the visceral voice. Welcome to the Visceral Voice Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Schneider. And I'm your co-host, Kimberly Doreen Burns. Through this podcast, we aim to bring you the most current, up-to-date research on voice science, function, pain science, movement, and everything in between. We also aim to bring you information and perspective from all angles of the theater industry. I am on a quest to learn everything I can about the living, breathing body and its intricate connection to the voice. This podcast documents the continuation of my learning and my experience as a professional singer, a nutritional consultant, a movement practitioner, and a manual therapist. And my learning as a professional performer, voice, acting, and musical theater educator. Join us as we strive to provide current, knowledgeable, creative, and compassionate information to help you restore, regain, and create happiness and success on your vocal journey. Kimberly and I are thrilled to bring you this extra special episode. We have a panel today discussing vocal injury. This panel is just extraordinary. We have Alexa Green, CJ Greer, Kimberly Doreen Burns, Mackenzie Bykowski, and Jenna Patstizek. And they are all talking about vocal injury, their own personal vocal injury. They're all voice teachers as well as incredible performers. So they're talking about their own experience, both as performers and voice teachers around vocal injury. We are challenging the stigma of vocal injury. And Kimberly and I could not be more thrilled to give you this special episode on vocal injury. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Thanks for listening. So I would love it if we could start off with each of you telling us a bit about your vocal journey, including your injury, and how you handled it at the time and how you overcame it. Let's go ahead and start with Alexa. Welcome to the podcast, Alexa. Hi, Christine. Thank you so much, Christine and Kimberly, for having me. I'm just so happy to be here. So I uh, grew up around music. My parents uh, were both classically trained musicians. And um, so I grew up around all kinds of music, fell in love with musical theater and, of course, pop music uh, pretty early on. And, you know, singing was my hobby. Um, And it turned into my passion. And I went to uh, the University of Cincinnati, College Conservatory of Music for musical theater, got my BFA, fell in love with Broadway, uh, and it turned into my profession. And then, of course, later, uh, I went back and got my master's, and I'm now an educator. Um, and anyway, so yeah, I sing professionally and teach professionally and experienced my first vocal injury in 2014 when I hemorrhaged my right vocal cord, uh, vocal fold. I was singing at a nightlife show uh, in the evenings, and uh, we sang all 11 o'clock numbers, and I experienced pretty much the perfect storm of working all day, talking all day, resting, warming up, singing, and basically just, you know, over blue there, Um, and immediately knew what I did. I could not speak. I sounded like a frog. I sang the second act of the show, and then I called my aunt furiously uh, at two o'clock in the morning on the way home and, you know, said, let's go to the ENT, call right away at 8 a.m., and sure enough, you know, saw that blood in my fold, which was Mm. crazy, Uh, but have since recovered, obviously, and uh, I get emotional talking about it, but it uh, was such a life-changing moment uh, for myself as a performer and an educator and taught me so much about my voice as well as others. Um, so I'm so thankful to have had the best team and the best support. Um, but it was quite a life-changing moment that I look back on now uh, with love, but uh, it took a while. <laughs> CJ, CJ Greer, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Can you tell us about your journey? Thanks so much, Christine, for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I So I did not study voice in my undergraduate years. I was an instrumental major. 
Um, but I sang all the time because I loved it and I was getting cast places. So I just kind of kept singing. And the very first time it was my very first profession. So I've had several vocal injuries, but the, the first ones came when I was doing my first professional gig, um, at Bush gardens. Um, uh, it was a summer gig and I was doing an outdoor show. And I was singing alto. So there were tons of things that were going wrong about what I was doing. But because I didn't have uh, vocal training at the time, I didn't know any of those things. Um, and so I ended up with pre-nodules for the first time. Well, it was nodules. It was, but they were not so hardened that anything couldn't be done about them. So, but I remember not being able to speak with any sort of clear tone. And there's a recording actually of us doing a cabaret um, where I'm singing the alto part on this quartet that we were singing, and I sound so raspy. <laughs> and so I've actually used that um, sometimes to sort of talk to my students about vocal health these days. Um, and at the time, this was in, I'm going to date myself here, but that's okay, 1997. And uh, the at the time, the therapy, the healing process was don't talk for two weeks, uh, use a whiteboard, I actually had to cancel the last two weeks of my contract, I think, in order to do that. Um, so that was the first time. Uh, it came back around a few years later. This was like three or four years later where I was I was actually performing in Tokyo Disneyland at the time. And normally it was a five-day-a-week week, five day a week gig and you had two days off, which was good because you're vocally you needed it. Um, but then I started they were changing the shows and I had to start rehearsing for the new show they were going to be putting into the space. And so I had no days off vocally for about two months and they came back and I was like, okay, now I have to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> um, but at the time uh, it was just part of the Japanese culture is very much like you don't mark, you don't give up. You always, show up and do your work. And it, um, they didn't understand me saying, I can't sing today because it's not healthy for me. And they didn't understand that. Um, and so I was, I found myself in a position where I was glad to be towards the end of my contract at the time, but, um, there wasn't much I could do. I called out of a couple of shows, which is also something a, you don't do in Japan and B you don't do at Disney, <laughs> um, very much, or at least with their, the way that Disney, Park was run. Um, and so that was very challenging. And uh, I mean, I'll just to give you a couple other things. It wasn't until, um, I was doing, I was on tour when Les Mis and I had, I popped my first Varix, uh, which is a permanent Varix on my right side. Um, and, uh, I was doing sister act and, uh, started having some vocal troubles because I wasn't balancing my musculature. Well, Mackenzie, welcome to the podcast. Can you let us know about your journey? Hi, Christine and Kim. Hi. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, sure. Uh, my journey is similar to many. Uh, I was a young musical theater singer. I was actually performing as Tony in West Side Story my senior year of high school. And throughout singing in high school, I was always very much in like the competitive honor choirs and all that stuff. And I would notice that my voice would, over those three-day weekends, would just kind of disappear. So for the final performance, I was lip syncing. Um, but I never thought too much of it because it, um, it would always come back. So three weeks before the performance for West Side Story, I went into the ENT for a deviated septum and he looked down my throat with a dental mirror and very dramatically told me that I would never sing again. I should give up any pursuit as a professional singer. Um, and it's just easier to accept if I accept it now versus later. So um, my mother was unhappy to say the least. And so we got a second opinion uh -huh. at the NYU Voice Center. And Dr. Amin said that I had some swelling and he wanted to put me through a speech therapy regimen um, before making any decisions. And we deduced that I actually had um, scar tissue on the anterior third of my right fold that was likely a product of complications with pneumonia or bronchitis. I had that a lot growing up. So um, I went and got my undergrad in music business at NYU. And then I continued right into my master's of vocal performance, musical theater, and vocal pedagogy. And um, 
I actually recently just had surgery to correct that scar tissue um, in early July. So I'm fresh off a surgery and yeah. Kimberly. Not only Kimberly is not only on the panel, but also my co-host here on the Visceral Voice podcast. Kimberly, thanks for being here on the panel as well. You are so welcome. I, I, we are all so brave and courageous to come here today and openly talk about this. And I'm so thrilled not only to be the co-host, but to, uh, to also tell my story. It's interesting, uh, and, and CJ, just listening to your story, my first uh, memory of vocal trauma also happened at Tokyo Disneyland. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was back, I'm um, also going to date myself, that was back in 2009. Um, and I, I remember, uh, you know, feeling some, some difficulties there. And I thought that it was maybe acid reflux or, you know, something along those lines. So I just did the traditional thing of like, oh, I'll drink more water and I'll rest and all of that. But um, anyway, that was my first memory of it. And I believe looking back now that I lived with it for about uh, nine years, uh, having these vocal difficulties. And my first true diagnosis happened back in 2015 when I was diagnosed with bilateral pseudocysts on my vocal folds. And uh, over the course of about two years um, that I lived with these pseudocysts, I was playing some rather large roles, uh, a couple specific shows that I remember having a lot of difficulty doing. Um, I was playing Dot in, in Sunday, and uh, I was doing uh, Eliza and My Fair Lady, which I've done several times. And uh, I finally just couldn't live like this anymore. I was very hoarse. I was not able to do my job. And uh, I hit rock bottom, some would say. And I went uh, to the Sean Parker Institute to Dr. Sulika. And uh, he confirmed the diagnosis of bilateral pseudocysts. And I finally broke down in July 2017 and had surgery, uh, probably the best day of my life and the scariest day of my life. And uh, then I went through therapy with Christine Estes and, uh, you know, rested and relearned my voice. And Mm -hmm. I feel better than ever. And I'm singing better than ever. And I'm so glad that we're openly talking about this today because I feel better than ever even right now just (laughs) talking to all of you. So that's my journey in a nutshell. Last but certainly not least, thank you for your patience. Jenna, welcome to the podcast. You were the voice. You were my host during my host episode, the very first episode on the podcast. We had the beautiful tones of Jenna. Jenna, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me back, Christine. It's been thrilling to watch the success of the podcast since we recorded that little baby episode a few a few months ago. <laughs> Yeah. So it's funny, you know, Mackenzie said something that's been sticking in my brain. He called um, his injury a perfect storm. And the way that I view vocal injuries and the way that I've been talking about it in my, you know, outreach work is talking about vocal injuries similar to sports injuries. And so if we compare the two, which are similar things. We're both professional users of our instruments. And then therefore we are highly susceptible and prone to injury because of the demands of our professions. Um, when you look at athletic injuries, it often is like a a Jenga board where it's just stacked on top of each other. So everyone has sort of brought up that their injury happened after having minor hiccups previously in their life. Last October to December, I was performing in a production of the Winter Wonderettes, which is a four female show. It's about two, two and a half hours of four part harmony where you're on stage the entire time. We were performing in a theater without microphones and we were doing eight or nine shows a week. Um, So I was also teaching at a university at the same time and then spending my one day off teaching all of my private clients. So by the end of the run, I was really, really tired. So once the show ended, 
at the beginning of January, I went away on vacation with my family and I got the flu and I had never coughed so hard in my life. And I remember I had a 103 degree fever and I was crying to my mom and to my husband. And I was like, I'm never going to sing again. I'm going to hurt myself. And little did I know that two months later, when I went back to the doctor, I had a vocal hemorrhage. I was operating on an already weakened basis and just continuing to push myself. So they discovered a hemorrhage. Later, my the thing on my left vocal fold was diagnosed as a polyp. And so um, ultimately, I decided to do surgery with Dr. Steven Zaitels up at Mass General. Um, we He removed the polyp on my left side. He also removed a recurring polyp on the right side, which was uh, caused by the polyp on the left. And then he also removed the hemorrhaging blood vessels. Just to sum up for our listeners, we're hearing such a, a variety of vocal injuries. And so I think it would be really helpful for us to go through our list and through our rotation once again, and for everyone just to quickly say just in two, three words, what they had for their vocal uh, injuries. I know a couple people had a different kinds. But um, Alexa, what did you have? I hemorrhaged my right vocal fold. CJ? Prenodules, hemorrhage, and vocal paresis. Mackenzie? Scar tissue removal, anterior webbing removal, and reactive polyps on the other fold removal from the scar tissue. And, uh, and I had bilateral pseudocysts. And Jenna? Hemorrhaging blood vessels and a, a polyps on my right and left vocal fold. We are today challenging this stigma. We are all openly discussing this. We are bravely showing the world that everyone goes through this. So what I would like to go through now in the same rotation is I want to ask everyone, did you hide your vocal injury? And if so, why did you do that? Alexa, we'll start with you. I absolutely did not hide it. Um, and you know, I feel very, what is a good word? I don't know. Um, I've been around vocal injury for a long time. I, I had a lot of friends experience it all throughout college, um, and all in the professional world. And, um, so I, I had known about it a lot. I knew there was a huge stigma and I just figured, well, um, if you, you know, want to, get the best help, you have to be open about it. Um, I also wanted really to help others and say, it's okay. Like we're, we're vocal athletes. We're professional. We're, we're, you know, operating at the top level here of our jobs, you know, requirements. We have to be open about it. So, um, I didn't hide it. What about you, CJ? Did you hide it? And if so, why? I didn't hide it because the first time it happened, I didn't understand or even know it was happening. It wasn't until somebody said, maybe you should like find out what's going on that I was like, is there a problem? I mean, I know that it's like hard for me to sing right now, but I just thought it was because I was like singing loudly outdoors and like constantly talking to the crowds of Bush Gardens. Cause that's what you do as an outdoor performer there. You know, you're sort of gathering your own crowd and, um, so I wasn't hiding it because I didn't even really realize it was or recognize it was happening. Um, and then once it did, they sort of just said, don't talk for two weeks. They actually also said, don't sing for several months. Um, and, and, um, that was interesting and to, to sort of negotiate, but like it, uh, it wasn't something I hid. Mackenzie, did you hide your vocal injury? And if so, why? Um, I think anyone that knows me uh, knows I don't wear a poker face very well. So <laughs> I, I was also very young when I found out that there was something other than the ins and outs of vocal fatigue happening. And I was in the middle of a show. So I think that especially being so young and everyone kind of knowing what's going on with his voice, I wasn't in a position where I could, or at least I felt as though I could hide it. So I became um, very vocal about it and very vocal about my needs. And I think that because of that, and it's all in good faith, but there were many people trying to help in any way they can. And as a result, there's a lot of contradicting information being spread in a very young mind. So I think that, you know, you have some teachers saying you need to go on complete vocal rest, do like this amount of steaming, make sure you're taking this type of inhaler, this does this. And so 
especially when you start discussing like medications and uh, home remedies that really should be done by a doctor. I think that I took it upon myself to figure out what should I be doing and educate myself as to how can I be the best advocate for not only my voice, but for anyone else who's going through an injury during a time when their options are semi-limited, being that they have an obligation to use their voice, even if, you know, they would prefer not to be. So, uh, no, I didn't hide it. <laughs> I hit it with every fiber of my being. Um, it was a very large secret that I that I held near and dear to me um, until I confessed it publicly on this uh, on this podcast in my episode. And uh, I just want to point out a couple of things that we've already heard that some people have had these injuries at theme parks. I find that interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, just that's my little soapbox moment, (laughs) but, um, yeah, I, I hit it and not only did I hide it, I had my friends, uh, very, very, very close friends and my family hide it for me. And, um, I was just so afraid that I would never get hired again, that I would, you know, get fired or lose my reputation of having these cords of steel, you know, that I would lose that, that label as if it was something to be proud of. Um, and, uh, yeah, I didn't want my castmates to know that I was having trouble um, when I would go to the doctor during shows to get, you know, my steroids or whatever. I would lie about where I was going. So um, I hit it very much just because I just didn't want to be less than what everyone thought I was. Uh, Jenna, how about you? Yeah, I'm right there with you, um, Kimberly. I, I totally hit it. I felt so much shame Mm -hmm. and embarrassment. This was such a hit to my ego. Like how could I, somebody who got her master's in vocal performance, how could I, somebody who'd been proudly training and singing since she was 11, how could I, a voice teacher, people pay me to learn to sing, how could I have an injury? Yes. And so I was, um, I actually, when the hemorrhage was discovered, I was two weeks away from starting my next show. And so once we, uh, once the hemorrhage cleared up and healed, And I was still dealing with the remnants of the polyp, knowing that I had to go and start rehearsals in two weeks. I was so nervous and such a basket case about anybody discovering that I was going through something and I was, you know, sounded different or weaker than usual because I was working with people who I had worked with previously. Um, And so I did everything in my power to not only hide my vocal injury, but also, um, completely shut myself out of most social situations with the cast because I wanted to just do everything I could like change my diet, sleep for eight to 10 hours. Like basically I lived like a monk during this show so that I could avoid any kind of prob like hypothetical problem, vocal situation. I know you all very well, and you all know me. So you know that I am very much about the whole body. And so I want to I wanna ask you, how do you feel your vocal injury affected your body, your self-esteem, you emotionally? How did it affect the whole? Alexa? I always say singing is a whole body experience, right? So we talk about the holistic approach a lot, and um, it's... The voice is super connected to our identity. Um, it's how we can mm-hmm. and you don't really think about it until you can't anymore. Um, and so I was absolutely scared. Um, it took a toll on my self-esteem for sure. However, I also felt uh, in a weird juxtaposition, pretty empowered. I, I felt like a professional. <laughs> Like, mm. well, I made it. I have a vocal injury, which is very skewered and weird to say. Uh, but when it happened, um, you know, I, I usually trust my instincts as a singer. And when I when I was performing and I, I hemorrhaged, I knew I did it. 
immediately. Um, I often say it felt like God was in my throat because it was the best sound I'd ever heard. I was singing uh, that song Once Upon a Time from Brooklyn, the musical, and at the end there's an A flat, and I sang that note and belted it, which is way too high to full voice belt, um, and it was amazing. It sounded amazing. <laughs> and then I tried to talk and I could not speak. So... I knew I did it. I knew I hemorrhaged. It was instantaneous, you know, no voice. Um, and it definitely took a toll on me. However, um, I just have to like give a shout out cause I had such a good team and, um, they really helped me with my self-esteem and said, you know, you are a singer, you've got this, you know how to handle this. Um, and I, I, I did have the tools. How about you, CJ? Well, I mean, at first it was it, for the, you know, the first time this happened and it wasn't something that I had any information about. I didn't really understand what was going on. And I wasn't planning a career in singing at the time. I was going to be a band director for the rest of my life. And so I, it wasn't something that it affected me emotionally at the time. I remember people looking at me and being like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. What? It's, a, it's fine. <laughs> um, but those were people who had vocal training and understood much more about what was happening to me than I understood. Um, and they all were planning careers in singing, and, and I sort of wasn't at the time. I was just doing this thing for fun. Um, but then when they told me to, so the whole like whiteboard for two weeks, that was hard. Um, and then they told me not to sing for a semester, and I had to drop out of my acapella group, my... Uh, my collegiate acapella group. And that was upsetting. And then I would notice myself start starting to sing with the radio and I would just, I'd just be in the car by myself. And then I had like, I would start doing it without realizing it. And then I would stop myself and be like, Oh, not allowed, not allowed to do this right now. I'm not really sure I understand why, but okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing that was going on at the time was that, um, so I was the drum major of my collegiate marching band of about 365 people, the marching Illini. And when you're a drum major, those people who know and understand the drum major world, there's a lot of, um, we'll, we'll call it, uh, aggressive calling the, yes. the drum field. <laughs> so, um, I, what I also didn't make the association with, and nobody was really guiding me through that was um, that one was just as bad as the other in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. So I was still doing all the loud calling for practices and on the field and stuff like that that I needed to be, but I wasn't singing. I have friends who I call, um, they have cords of steel. They can do anything. They can smoke, they can drink caffeine, they can have dairy, they can do all the things that I can absolutely not do. Um, and, uh, and so I had to really come to a place of understanding of like, you know what, your voice is your voice, but mine is mine. And I have to take good care of this sucker. Mackenzie, how about you? It's interesting. So my injury, and I'm sure many of us can relate to this. The doctors always prefer, especially with the voice to take a more conservative approach. So they're like, let's see what we can do without intervention being surgery. So my, especially with scar tissue, at the time, 10 years ago, the the expectation was you do nothing. This is what you have. And so um, throughout the years of becoming a singer, I would go to perform and I would sing in front of a class and I made sure everyone knew, oh, this is what's going on with my voice out of an insecurity that they would perceive me as less capable or incapable. So I kind mm -hmm. of worked with my injury as a cloak of like, I'm a good singer, but I have, you know, I have this going on. And so as my singing developed and progressed, it just reached a point where I was feeling no matter how conservative I was, like CJ said, no matter how much I s drank water, slept, uh, withdrew from social activity, loud environments. And I was like, I'm not living a full life. This is taking over my life. And that cannot be. It cannot be. There has to be a way to balance out being a singer and feeling really good about my voice and also l doing things I want to do within reason. And so finally, when I was told we're going to operate, and just to be clear, scar tissue is still to this day a very tricky surgery. It's dependent on how deep the scar tissue goes into the lamina propria um, or the vocal fold itself. And thankfully... 
you know, my doctor said, we won't know until we're actually, I put you under. And so thankfully it was best case scenario and he was able to remove it. It was on the very superficial layer. However, um, psychologically speaking and self-esteem, it's, it's very challenging to feel as though you're compromised or it's somehow your fault. You Mm -hmm. were the cause of Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think Christine, you know, better than anyone else, the effect that that has had on my body with just tensing muscles that never used to get tense in the way that they did, or rather my injury would cloak my ability to feel those muscles working as hard as they did. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting journey to observe how my body is reacting to this new instrument and how much it did actually compromise my whole body and mind. Kimberly? Because I was hiding it, uh, I retreated to this really, really terrible dark place um, and developed some intense depression, um, really bad performance anxiety, where um, I would just be so incredibly nervous to take the stage every night. Um, I was uh, living like a monk, you know, retreating from uh, my husband at the time, my family, my friends. Um, I was just this burning sort of vessel of of lies because I was hiding all of this this pain inside. So my self esteem was was pretty low. <laughs> it was pretty pretty low. Um, mm. So uh, and then as far as my my body. Uh, I had a, a lot of stiffness in my body because I was harboring all of that information. And uh, the main thing that was uh, affected in my body was my, my throat uh, and my breath. I really felt that I could not breathe um, and that I was choking. And that mm-hmm. sort of has to do with the emotional aspect as well because I was harboring all this information. I couldn't speak my truth. And that really showed up in, in my, my throat, uh, and in my, in my breath. How about you, Jenna? Well, when I was first diagnosed with the hemorrhage and then my ENT, Gwen Corvin suggested that I come back in a month after letting it heal, starting rehearsals. And let's see what the situation is with the thing on the left side of your vocal folds. So I, in the meantime, I was desperate for anything to save my vocal ship. I was hoping that a change in my diet would reduce the extra inflammation and I'd be able to go back at the end of the month and she'd be like, wow, that thing has disappeared. You don't have to have surgery. So I committed to doing everything in my power. I gave up alcohol. I went 64 days without a glass of wine or a swig of beer. I gave up sugar. I went 32 days without a cookie, a starburst, or a drop of honey in my tea. I committed to this strict, like Kimberly just said, a monk-like regiment of self-care involving yoga, Pilates, gluten-free, dairy-free, low FODMAP diet, eight hours of sleep a night, steaming every single day, my steaming regiment was using my neti pot or sorry using my nebulizer then doing my neti pot then gargling with salt water so it just added all of this extra time to my my self-care schedule every day i mean you know me christine and i love to swing a kettlebell and i love to lift heavy and all of a sudden i had a vocal injury and i was like maybe lifting weights is the problem maybe i should just stretch Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. see what that does. And, you know, all of that kind of worked when I went back to see her and did a scope, she was like the, the inflammation has significantly decreased, but it is still there. And so I did end up going through with the surgery and, and like everybody has said, that was not a sustainable lifestyle for me to be able to to give up the things that make a uh, living fun. You know, I, I, there's like some kind of, um, Instagram image or like meme or something that's like, yeah, those extra five pounds are like 
cupcakes and happiness. And (laughs) so like, I'm like, yeah, I think I'd rather have those. Like it's worth it to me. So feels similar vocally. I was like, I mean, I love that post show. Let's just go have a beer and like gossip with, with the cast. And so I was, I was really missing that. Once I went through with the surgery, what was really fun is with Alexa's voice teacher, my voice teacher, Joan Later, who is like the shining beacon of my life. She really helped me get through this. And, and it was really fun actually to work with her afterward because she was like, I'm so excited to see what happens to your voice after surgery, because we'll be able to really figure out like, is it, was it because there was a polyp in your way that you weren't being able to produce the the soprano sounds that you wanted to do? Or is it something else? And so quickly after I started speaking and singing again, she was like, nope, it's definitely your posture. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> I thought that it was just because I had something in my way and I could just blame my anatomy, but actually it is still something that I need to work on and still need to um, be cognizant of when I'm singing. And so I think that it it definitely has positively influenced my or positively impacted my relationship with my body because now I really do understand having gone through this oh that old saying your body is your instrument yeah that's true yeah. so we really need to take care of our instruments and it's not just about thinking about what's happening in our throat while we're singing it's what's happening with your feet what's happening with your head what's happening with your your spine and your rib cage and so it actually has become a more expansive opportunity when I'm singing instead of worrying what I sound like I'm now having more fun thinking about what other parts of my body are doing and then how, if I change them slightly, how does that affect the sound that comes out of my mouth? Let's get back to the the title of the episode, right? The title of the episode is Challenging the Stigma. We need to challenge the stigma and make this, you know, this whole thing demystified, okay? So let's go through the rotation again and just in two or three sentences, let's all say why it's so important to talk about this And why is challenging this stigma so important? Alexa, we'll start with you. It's uh, super important, I feel. And I um, I think Mackenzie said it, uh, to be a vocal advocate. You know, when you go through something, um, now we stand up for this. And something I'm really passionate about is arts accessibility and education. And, you know, I feel like a theme here is that you know, a lot of us just had no idea how to take care of ourselves, how to know how to operate, um, you know, as a singer. Um, and so there is a, a, a line, a path where the artistry meets the science, right? Um, and you can sort of combine the two. And so I think it's important to talk about it. Um, and something, you know, I really hope to be is, is like this Um, to help and uplift others, right? To help others learn about their voice and know um, that it's okay, that it's great. Yeah. Actually going to become better because of it. CJ, uh, why why do you feel challenging the stigma is so important? Gosh, I love everything that everybody's saying, first of all. Um, uh, I'm so glad to be (laughs) listening to you guys and sharing with you guys. Um, I, I just feel like there are a ton, I've had a ton of other physical injuries from athletics and from dancing, you know, soccer player and all this kind of stuff. And you pull a hamstring or you sprain an ankle or we, from sister director, we called it nun neck. You have neck and shoulder injuries um, from those darn heavy habits that we were swinging around all the time. Like they all, all those kinds of things, they keep you from performing your job for some reason um, and for, for injury reasons. And for some reason, the response to those like external injuries leans much more towards like understanding and compassion from everybody. Um, stage managers and and many other people are like, oh yeah, of course you need to rest that hamstring or you need to rest that rolled ankle or whatever it is. Because and I wonder if it's maybe because maybe that it's not just a performing injury that many other people have pulled a hamstring from baseball or football or you know whatever that they can relate. Um, and so for the people who can't relate to a vocal injury, that we need more education around this. We need more conversation. We need mm-hmm. more education around this. Um, mm-hmm. And it's really made me want to see, I know that 
the the West End, for instance, always has a vocal coach assigned to a show. Um, and it feels like to me that's finally starting to come into the Broadway community, but I really want to see it more prevalent. I right. want to see some sort of like vocal captain or, or vocal therapists that are assigned to shows, speech therapists or something like that that are assigned to shows. And I, I don't just mean speech SLPs because I think those are important for some things, but I would really like to see vocologists or, um, uh, SLPs that are singing specialists assigned to shows for, you know, you know, the shows have, um, in the Broadway community in general, and I'm talking about the Broadway community at the moment, but I think this, this is a, a, obviously a larger conversation because it does go to theme parks and regional theaters and cruise mm-hmm, ships and mm-hmm, all that mm-hmm. stuff, but they have physical therapists that will come in between shows and you can have a physical therapy appointment in between shows so that you feel better and can do your second show. Why aren't we considering that for the voice as well? Right. Why aren't we having vocal therapy appointments? I think all of us are virtually applauding you right now. Mackenzie, Mackenzie, why do you feel that challenging the stigma is so important? Uh, You know, singing encompasses many intersections being a uh, the, it's a science. It is an art form. There's a business to it. And at the center of that intersection is ego. And I think that everybody that sings inevitably compares themselves to one another. So I think that when someone is met with a vocal injury, their mind immediately goes to, I'm broken. I did this. Yeah. I'm never going to be able to do this again. It's gonna like, there's no way this can happen for me. And the science doesn't support that. And I think that it's really important to quiet those voices that I think all of us can agree we have experienced at some point in our journeys and really listen to our support team that lifts us up and the science that says, you can do this. You might have to do it in your own unique, beautiful way, but you can make this happen. We just have to figure out what works for you. For my my two cents, um, I think it's important to challenge the stigma. So we educate our young artists in our studios, and we teach them that they need to learn that this is more common than they think. Um, I think that's also my second point. I want this to be known that it's more common for artists of high levels to have these injuries. Um, I also think it's important that we, uh, and someone already said this, that we need to be treated like Olympic athletes. We need to be treated as such and have those therapists on hand. And I also think it's important for creators and for certain shows to understand that some of those shows actually uh, can cause vocal injuries and for composers to understand too that maybe uh, maybe I won't write that G sharp for the woman to belt. Um, so that's also why I think it's important for the future of musical theater. Jenna, how about you? Dr. Zaitels has a quote in one of his studies that says, similar to other athletes, vocal performers should be perceived as professionals with potentially long careers for whom it is common to sustain injuries. So just echoing what we've all said, singers are athletes, athletes get injured, and there is an expectation for athletes to get injured. So we need to treat singers like athletes with that expectation that injuries might be part of our vocal game and let us all as an industry treat ourselves like people who work with vocal athletes. So yes, it is important for our students. It's important for us to lead by example, to destigmatize injury so that people get the help that they need to get. And it is also important for us as vocal athletes ourselves to help the industry better understand vocal injury and its common prevalence so that the industry can rethink the ways in which it's showing up to support the singers that are on our stages. Thank you all. Wow. This has just been extraordinary. And part of what I wanted in this panel was not just those performers who have experienced vocal injury, but all of you, all five of you are voice teachers. And I really wanted voice teachers to be on this podcast and on this panel. To the listeners, we are talking with five very fierce voice teachers. These these are extraordinary singers. We are talking about top of the line here. 
They were all really wonderful singers and teachers. So we're very lucky to have them on this panel. And you can see that vocal injuries happen and that it is important to challenge the stigma. How do you promote vocal health in your studio? Kimberly, how about you? I have every client fill out an intake form, you know, just asking if they've had vocal injury or any sort of tenderness or strangeness or weirdness when singing. Um, I certainly advocate them getting uh, uh, scoped and seeing an ENT so we have a good baseline to to look at. Um, I talk very much about uh, nutrition and what they're putting in their bodies when they eat and drink. Um, their exercise in their body. And uh, also, I just have this little tip sheet, you know, that I give them that talks about all all the, the normal things about hydrating and avoiding caffeine, don't smoke, don't shout. Um, and I also uh, teach them how to speak correctly. I teach them how to find their relative uh, speaking pitch and to make sure that they're speaking in a healthy way throughout their entire day so they don't um, think that it's separate from singing because to sing healthily, we need to speak healthily. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us on this panel, Vocal Injury Challenging the Stigma. Thanks for being here with us today, for all of your input, for your courage to talk and open up about your injuries, how you went through those injuries, and also all of the things that you have learned from them and how you encourage or are influenced in the work that you do now. Thank you all so much for being here. Alexa Green, CJ Greer, Mackenzie Bykowski, Kimberly Doreen Burns, and Jenna Pastizak. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please tell your colleagues, students, and friends to subscribe, rate, and write us a review. You can find us on Instagram or Facebook. And feel free to check out my website at www.thevisceralvoice.com for information on programs and upcoming events. I hope you join us next time for another wonderful conversation on The The Visceral Visceral Voice. Voice.